welcome all. It is uh, the week of Remembrance Day, and uh, we are all here to talk about some of the wonderful things that that Canada has done and is doing uh, through our wonderful IDRC. You may wonder how they relate, but there is a kind of seamless connection between those who go out and fight uh, for our country and uh, and uh, many have died, and those are the people we remember this week. And between, build, between that and building for the future, which is what IDRC does through its research and its caring and nurturing of what is going on in the developing world. So as chairman of the Board of Governors, I'm pleased to welcome you to this meeting. It's our fourth annual public meeting, considering that we were founded in 1970. Uh, you know, the arithmetic doesn't work very well. But we've only, uh, this is our fourth, and I must say, as chairman, it's something that I really welcome every year to meet with members of the community who care about our organization and our work. En ma qualité, président du conseil du gouverneur, je suis ravi de vous souhaiter la bienvenue à notre quatrième assemblée publique annuelle. Nous sommes heureux d'avoir l'occasion de parler de notre travail aux Canadiens et Canadiennes. And before I uh, begin, I should inform you that aside from those evil camera guys back there, this is being videotaped and will go on our website. So smile, everyone, and uh, you know, make sure you have your best face to the camera. Um, the mission of Canada's uh, International Development Research Center is to create knowledge, and knowledge is not something that comes out of a vacuum. It's not something that ends up in a vacuum. Knowledge is something that will benefit humanity. And our job is not just to create it, but it is to help others create it for themselves. In fact, that I think, David, is the most important part of our mission. IDRC supports researchers and innovators around the world as they work to improve health, to increase prosperity, to enhance food security, and promote and build a democracy in many countries around the world. And in so doing, we are deeply engaged with the research community in other countries, but also with the Canadian research community. What we try and do is connect Canadian researchers to their colleagues in other countries that are less developed and mobilize them to team, team up on issues that are of concern to us all. Our support helps some of the best and brightest scientists in the world find new ways to improve the lives of their fellow citizens. Our programs also help to advance the government of Canada's priorities in international development, because they are, after all, the ones that kind of visualize and set the Canadian agenda in areas such as maternal and child health and food security. To the point, for the past three years, IDRC has managed the government's $62 million Canadian International Food Security Research Fund. And that fund brings together scientists in, developing a con er, in Canada and developing countries, and they undertake practical research to combat hunger and nutrition. In other words, uh, this is a project about ideas. The program builds on IDRC's strong record of support for agriculture and food security. It's not a new one for us. It is an ongoing priority. And it's also one of our many great collaborations with CEDA, with the Canadian International Development Agency, which is the government organ that delivers aid on the ground. 
Last year, Prime Minister Stephen Harper announced a further $62 million to expand this fund of innovative agricultural research. 19 teams involving 11 Canadian universities. Gee, I thought there was only one, David. It's the University of Toronto and, and plus the rest. Um, but there are 11 that are now working with developing country counterparts. And what they're doing is uh, a working towards improving food production and increased access to nutritious food. More generally, IDRC staff administered a total budget of almost $288 million. And $240 million of this comes from you and I, from uh, the Parliament of Canada, um, and to a uh, uh, the taxpayers of our country, and that uh, amount represents 4%, $240 million, represents 4% of Canada's aid budget, um, and the others go to other organizations, or the, uh, the rest goes to other organizations, obviously, but it's a very important little niche for us and for the research that we do. Our staff, our wonderful IDRC staff and professionals helped launch or maintain almost 900 research projects last year, along with other activities. And as always, our objective is to support homegrown solutions. We want developing countries to develop their own solutions, and our main objective is to help them do that at home and not in our Canadian incubator, but in their incubator. And that helps make countries less dependent on foreign aid. Now you're going to read about these activities in our annual report, which I didn't bring to wave around, but they're available on the table outside. And I hope you'll take it with you. It's a, quite a concise uh, 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 report on what we've been doing, and there's lots of meat in it. IDRC has always, just for the record, been a prudent a manager of taxpayer dollars. And this is in part thanks to the good internal management of the organization, also to the chairman of our finance and audit committee, audit committee on the board, Denis de Sotel. And uh, uh, he deserves a lot of credit, as do our internal people because that management stands us in good stead over many years, and this year that we're talking about in particular, because we, it helped us adjust to a smaller budget, smaller parliamentary grant. Our grant was reduced by just over 10% um, in, in keeping with the, the reductions throughout the government and uh, the husbandry of the country's financial resources, we are doing our part, uh, but I might say no more than our part. We, you know, we were, we, uh, were part of reductions that were taken throughout government, and uh, it, it's very difficult always to manage, but our organization did it very well. And our board and our senior managers have been deeply engaged in efforts First of all, to find savings wherever possible. And secondly, to preserve IDRC's mandate. And thirdly, and very important, to ensure that our grantees, those who do the work for us in the field, get the support that they need. Now, when uh, the organization and management was managed, what when management was managing, which is what management does, they tried to avoid cuts to programs as much as possible. Uh, but we did, however, have to reduce our activities in some areas. Uh, one of them was social innovation. And we will be closing our Innovation for Inclusive Development program at the end of March. And that was too bad. It was a good program. We all recognize that. Perhaps it will come back another day, but one has to find one's great strengths and uh, maybe forego some others. 
We now employ as IDRC a staff of about 100, or 400, I'm sorry, in this building and at four regional offices around the world. We have consolidated our physical presence in Asia and in Africa. Our office in Singapore is closed and our office in New Delhi is now handling IDRC's portfolio of projects across Asia. Our regional office in West Africa and Senegal is also closing, but our commitment to the region is unwavering. Our office in Nairobi, the board had a briefing on this today, it's now IDRC's regional office for sub-Saharan Africa. It is becoming a fully bilingual office so we can continue to serve the needs of our francophone grantees in West Africa. And I must say management has ha taken a very thoughtful approach to how this gets merged, these two offices, and how they will manage this huge uh, part of the African subcontinent uh, in the future. Um, we regard these as administrative changes, although I'm sure they may sound like more than that, but IDRC remains as active as ever in West Africa and, and in Southeast Asia after the closing of Singapore. Our real impact, as everyone here probably knows, does not come from having a bricks and mortar presence in as many countries as possible. It comes from our grantees, the people who actually do the research on the ground, being there in their many locations, researching and looking for ideas and innovating to improve lives and inform policies in their own regions, many times that can be applied to other regions as well. In another change, IDRC is now guided by 14 governors, down from 18. It is a combination of international and domestic, as you know. I'm happy to report that that strong mix remains, and uh, there are wonderful international leaders and Canadians with experience in governance and finance and scholarship. Uh, we, as an organization, as a board, and as management, stay in close touch with developing regions of the world, in part thanks to the perspective that is provided by the international members of our board. And uh, we're very grateful to have Canadian directors, one of whom, or governors, one of whom will speak to you tonight. And uh, 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 those, as uh, Denis is here, experienced and thoughtful and who care about the organization and about its mission. Uh, so um, thank you again for coming and uh, I am looking forward to hearing next from Monty Solberg who has been a member of our board since 2009. He's a very special person to all of us. He's going to tell you about his experience as a governor of IDRC. And he's a, he is, as of, he is a senior advisor to a firm called Fleischmann Hilliard in Calgary. And uh, except uh, as of uh, the end of the month, he is going to move on to other challenges but he has served as Canada's Minister of Human Resources and Social Development, Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, um, which I'm very pleased about since when I served in both those capacities, they were combined. Minister of Employment and Immigration as it was back in the Dark Ages, and then they kind of made it a different title, same mission. Um, and uh, he's been awarded both the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal and the Alberta Centennial Gold Medal. So he's coming to come and share his thoughts on IDRC's presence in Canada and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Barbara, uh, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. 
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to talk to you about my experience as a member as the IDRC Council of Governors. Being here uh, today, it's a real pleasure for me and an honor for me uh, to actually address you. But I have to tell you that I wasn't always someone who was comfortable talking about IDRC. When I was uh, first asked uh, to join the board, I didn't immediately say yes. I uh, had it in my head that the IDRC was this sort of obscure organization. I wasn't completely clear on what it was that the IDRC uh, did. It seemed maybe it might, like it might be a bunch of busy work, and I just wasn't sure what they, what they were accomplishing. Uh, the only thing I knew about the IDRC at that point was that Barbara McDougall was the chair. And, uh, of course, I'm a Barbara McDougal fan, and so that made me somewhat interested. And then, <laughs> and then I found out later that Denny Desotel was, uh, was on the board, and I had known Denny from his years as Auditor General, and that, that gave me some confidence. There were a couple of credible people working for that organization. So after a period of time, I put up my hand and said I would... Uh, I would join the board and I immediately realized that I had made a terrible mistake because when I got to my first board meeting, I had no idea what uh, people were talking about. I didn't understand the issues, the lingo, the people involved. But over time, I came to realize that the IDRC was doing something I really could relate to. Uh, they were helping countries and people become self-reliant. And I thought of that as a great, if you'll forgive me, a great conservative virtue. So I could relate to that. And uh, over time, I could see that the IDRC was making some tremendous contributions in a number of ways. They had been at the forefront of the Green Revolution, you know, something that uh, I could relate to in the sense that, you know, many people in my old riding, uh, farmers, had been very excited about some of the developments that were going on in the developing world at that time because of their own deep interest in agriculture. And of course, today they continue to lead the way when it comes to food security, issues like food security and uh, child and maternal health. But you know, all of this really came home for me when I went on a trip to Guatemala a couple of years ago and saw some of the work that IDRC was doing there. When I went to Guatemala, one of the things that we, we did was we went and saw a project that IDRC had invested in that was designed to combat Chagas disease. Now, if you don't know what Chagas disease is, it's a, it's a disease that afflicts about 10 million people worldwide, 700,000 new cases every year, and it's, a, it's caused by a parasite transmitted by those ugly beetles down on the bottom there, and they actually go and, uh, in the middle of the night, they will go and take that needle of a proboscis, a proboscis and stick it into people and transmit a, a parasite as a result. And so IDRC had invested in a researcher uh, through the University of San Carlos in Guatemala Seven hundred thousand dollars, six hundred thousand from IDRC, a hundred thousand uh, from uh, the Gates Foundation. This disease is very debilitating. It hurts the obviously the the health of many people in Guatemala. And so the goal of this project was to employ this local researcher to go and find out how we could prevent the spread of of Chagas disease, and all, and then to come up with some local and practical solutions. Uh, to dealing with that because, of course, people in these villages where they were getting Chagas disease had very little money. So as a result, we, we sponsored a researcher and uh, uh, this person ended up uh, figuring out that very often when the, when the forest was cut back around uh, these villages, uh, these insects would come and live in the palm trees near the homes and then eventually would migrate into the cracks of the adobe homes that people lived in. 
And uh, as a result of this research, she figured out that what we needed to do was find local materials to plaster all of the walls of the adobe homes on the inside and the outside. In many cases, there were, for instance, chickens living in the home, so those were moved out to chicken coops, to separate buildings. They got rid of the palm trees that were too close to the house, those kinds of things. And uh, in the end, they had tremendous success with this. So for $700,000, uh, this project has now been picked up by the Guatemalan uh, government. We expect that it will spread uh, through uh, other countries in Central America and really go on to help prevent the spread of Chagas, uh, which is really hurting so many people today. In fact, Chagas, I guess I didn't explain this, uh, can lead to all kinds of uh, ailments like heart disease. It can be fatal. It causes still still uh, born uh, children, this kind of thing. So it was extraordinarily important, uh, the work that was being done. And it was a it was an eye-opener for me, as someone who had read now uh, a number of things about what IDRC was doing, to finally go and see with my own eyes uh, the kind of work that uh, IDRC was doing and see that it was really having a, a dramatic and a serious impact in a positive way on the lives of so many, so many people. But, you know, uh, none of this can happen, of course, without uh, terrific people. And uh, one of the things I've come to, dis to uh, find at uh, IDRC is that we have a staff of people who are extraordinarily dedicated to the work they do. And I've seen this here in Ottawa, and now I've seen it in the field as well. And, and people who come to IDRC don't come here for a job. They come here because they're on a mission. They believe deeply in the work of the IDRC and the changes that can be made when money is invested in an intelligent way. And I have become, it's been my pleasure to get to know some of these people and see how committed people really are. But of course, none of that can happen without terrific leadership. And that's one of the things that I'd like to celebrate a little bit here today. First of all, I mentioned uh, Barbara, and Barbara has been a terrific chair of the IDRC, a former foreign affairs minister, a former minister of immigration, as she mentioned, in human resources. She's done a, an amazing job as the chair of the IDRC, taking us through some, some difficult times. But we've been doubly blessed when it comes to leadership, because we've also had as our president, David Malone. And uh, David is someone whom you will hear from in a moment. And if you haven't met David before, you will get a sense very quickly of his intelligence and passion for international development and his commitment uh, to something that he has devoted much of his life uh, to. I also want to say just a word about the board of the IDRC. We have an international board. Barbara mentioned it's a smaller board now with 14 uh, members, uh, but it's become, it has been a real pleasure for me and a, an amazing learning experience to get to know people from around the world, because half of our board is, uh, is international. Many of them work in international development, and they have helped me sort of make my journey from someone who didn't know a lot about international development, research, uh, to someone who's become quite convinced uh, that we must continue to invest in these areas. In fact, uh, someone said to our board recently that the opposite of research is ignorance, and of course, we must do better than that. In closing, I just want to uh, say to uh, Barbara, uh, thank you for your patience as I've taken time to come up to speed, figuring out what it is that the IDRC uh, does. And secondly, and finally, I want to say, uh, I think on behalf of all of the board, uh, thank you to David Malone, because as you may know, yeah, David will soon be leaving IDRC, going on uh, to do more of this wonderful kind of work in Tokyo. And David, I'm always sort of stuck when it comes to saying goodbye to people. I don't like saying goodbye. But I have to admit, a, a quote came to mind when, uh, when I realized I was going to have to maybe say something uh, when I got up here. 
And it used to be a very powerful quote, but then now lately it started showing up on coffee mugs, uh, at chapters and book bags. But it's still a quote that means something to me. And it's from Thoreau. And of course, he said, uh, he said, if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life that he imagines, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. And David, I know that has been something that really describes your career up until this point, and I have every confidence it will describe your career in Tokyo. I just want to thank you for your ter terrific leadership, and uh, we wish you all the best uh, in the years to come. Thank you very much. This is a, a technical moment, um, <laughs> just for the commercial break, because our next speaker also has a little slideshow. So um, uh, just, you know, do what you do when commercials are on. <laughs> okay, are we done? No. Okay. Well, I want to thank uh, Monty, of course, who's been such a a wonderful asset to the board. He sells himself short when he says he didn't know very much when he arrived. What he did know was know a lot about management and uh, about how boards should organize and mobilize and govern. And he knows how to ask questions. And that's the most important role of, of a board member and to try and draw out uh, what management is doing and why it's important, and he has certainly done that for us. Um, he, <clears throat> he has pointed out that we do try and uh, uh, align our activities with, first of all, Canadian values. That's the most important part of our alignment, but also with Canadian government priorities, and particularly in science and innovation and in the foreign policy agenda. Um, we, for example, are proud to support the expansion across Africa of the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, commonly known as AIM, as they say. Everything has an acronym. In 2010, the Prime Minister announced $20 million in federal support for this effort, and it's known as the Next Einstein Initiative. Uh, IDRC administers Canada's contribution to this program. It's a pioneering one. It's never been done before. It's carving out new space and aiming to reverse Africa's brain drain by educating young Africans in applied mathematics and encouraging them, and not forcing them, but encouraging them to stay at home and build this expertise for other generations. So in IDRC, uh, and here today, we have with us someone who can tell us a lot more about this exciting initiative, uh, Nasser Farouki. And he leads a program that seeks to put science and innovation at the service of growth and development. And he and his team oversee projects like this initiative, the Next Einstein Initiative as well as other uh, uh, programs in, that organize partnerships with uh, Canada's Science Granting Council. So we want to welcome Nasser here today. He is one of our great thinkers and innovators in the organization. We heard something about this program in the board meeting today, and I'm sure you're going to find this as exciting as we did. Thank you. Merci, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Hello. I welcome you. I would like to talk to you about science, innovation, and development. The three Here are the three following messages that you remember. Science and innovation it could uh, diminish poverty. World scientific cooperation is in the best interest of Canada. And this cooperation depends on 
scientific capacity building in developing countries. And I will talk about these points uh, through one of the programs I am responsible for at the IDRC at, uh, the, at AIMS. First and foremost, it's my privilege to work at IDRC because I believe that science and innovation can alleviate poverty. Vaccines have helped defeat smallpox, new technologies connect us as never before, and innovation has lifted millions of people out of poverty in Brazil, China, and India. I don't advocate blind faith in science. It's led us down many regrettable paths, such as the use of DDT in the 1950s. And more recently, unsustainable development has left us vulnerable to a changing climate and food, water, and energy shortages. Nor do I want to suggest that these major challenges can be solved by science alone. Our researchers also focus on stronger institutions and improving governance. Nevertheless, this is a tremendously exciting time to be a scientist. The development of drought-resistant crops could um, help feed the world's poor. Nanotechnology could dramatically reduce the cost of supplying drinking water to millions of people. And open science, whereby many scientists work together on a problem, could dramatically accelerate scientific advances. Recently, a team of connected researchers identified uh, the enzyme um, in, the HIV in the HIV virus. And in three weeks, they solved a problem that had stumped scientists working individually for over a decade. So how do we harness science and innovation so that it solves both local and global problems? Well, key is building scientific capacity, and that brings me to the focus of my presentation. IDRC is implementing Canada's $20 million contribution to the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Mathematical sciences are the backbone of a modern economy. Uh, solutions to challenges, uh, to problems in agriculture, in health and finance, all require um, advanced mathematical skills. And while nearly a million students graduate from African universities each year, high-level training in scientific and technical fields is generally unavailable. And this results in a shortage of researchers in Africa. Ames is beginning to change that. Launched in 2003 in Cape Town, it uh, takes bright university graduates across Africa and puts them through a rigorous course in applied advanced mathematics. Ames seeks to unlock and nurture scientific talent so that within our lifetime, people of rare ability, Africa's own Einsteins, emerge. Ames has important connections with Canada. Canada was, uh, Can Canada was Ames' first donor, and as Barbara mentioned, Canada committed $20 million in 2010 to help Ames expand to five centers uh, across Africa. A new center opened in Senegal in 2011, and another was launched in Ghana in August of this year. Second, Ames is a brainchild of Dr. Neil Turok, the tall fellow in this picture. As the executive director of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, he works with top scientists um, from across the world, uh, like Dr. Stephen Hawking. And Neil, in fact, has just concluded a series of lectures um, across Canada on the coming quantum age, based on his new book, The um, Universe Within. And these um, lectures are being broadcast this very week on CBC Radio. Now, Neil was inspired by his parents anti-apartheid activists who were um, jailed and forced to leave South Africa. And when his father said, okay, you're a big time uh, doctoral student, what are you gonna do for Africa? He started developing the ideas that would lead to the first AIM Center. The third connection with Canada is that um, several Canadian universities provide scholarship funding uh, to AIMS, enabling uh, students uh, to attend uh, the facilities. And finally, several Canadian academics lecture at AIMS, including from UBC, from Waterloo, and Université de Montréal. So what's so special about AIMS? Well, from the beginning, AIMS has been about excellence. The best students from across Africa are selected 
um, on full scholarship exclusively um, on merit. And the teaching staff is composed of volunteers <coughs> drawn from some of the world's best universities, drawn by the talent, the, the talent and the passion of AIM students. And among the professors are several fields medalists, which is considered the highest award in mathematics, um, as well as several Nobel laureates, including Professor uh, Klaus von Klitzing, who, is sh who won the Nobel Prize uh, for Physics in 1985, and he's shown here dancing with his AIMS students. Another key to AIMS is active rather than rote learning. One AIMS student explained to me that she used to solve the problem without understanding it. Now she's taught to take the problem apart, to get inside of it before solving it. The AIMS Center in Cape Town has trained 1,000 high school teachers uh, in this approach, and a recent UNESCO award recognized its innovative teacher training. And I think what facilitates this um, um, this teaching style is a non-hierarchical environment at the school. Students, tutors, and teachers all live and take meals together at each facility, taking AIMS um, collaboration uh, and learning beyond the classroom. Since the opening of the first center in Cape Town, Ames has already graduated more than 400 students, one third of them women, from 33 of the 47 countries in Africa. Over 87% of the graduates have gone on to advanced masters and doctoral programs. And it will take some time for the new cohort of um, Ames alumni to begin contributing to Africa's development. Um, however, they are beginning to move into key positions in African uh, research centers, universities, and industry. For instance, seven University of Khartoum lecturers, including the head of statistics, are AIMS alumni. Another uh, seven AIMS alumni lecture at the University of Ghana. And a 2004 graduate from Cameroon is now working at ESCOM, a South African energy utility. AIMS alumni are also beginning to earn international recognition. For instance, a 2005 Tanzanian graduate um, is a le leading malaria researcher at the Ifakara uh, Research Institute in Tanzania, and uh, recently um, was selected a fellow of the Third World Organization for Women Scientists. Another Ames graduate from Nigeria was recently selected the L'Oreal UNESCO um, Women in Science Regional Fellow. Ames has been very successful so far, but of course there are challenges too. The first is sustainability. Canada's contribution is meant to leverage additional contributions, and it's working. A major international funder is about to announce uh, a large contribution to AIMS. But the AIMS model depends on African governments um, making contributions and assuming full uh, responsibility for running costs after five years. AIMS proof of success will be that African governments take on this responsibility. And uh, signs uh, are promising, governments have committed, but it's not until money uh, begins to flow that we'll know for sure. A second challenge is growing too fast or diluting um, the AIMS model. Under its first phase, AIMS was meant to encompass five centers, South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, um, and Ethiopia. However, the Nigerian center was dropped because of its failure to meet AIMS' criteria, including committing to full scholarships for all AIMS' students. And while this was unfortunate for Nigeria, this may have been a positive outcome for AIMS. As I told Neil, the best way to convince African governments of proof of concept is to maintain consistency with its business model and to protect its brand to maintain its quality. And second, expanding more slowly than originally envisaged may not necessarily be a bad thing. Um, for instance, three well-functioning and well-resourced centers in countries where hosts governments honor their financial commitments uh, may be preferable to five less sustainable ones. While the rigorous training that AIM students receive is essential, it's what they will do with it that will determine whether they become leaders in African academia, uh, industry, and the government, and whether they will help Africa develop. So to date, AIMS alumni have been finding prominent posts uh, on the continent continent, but will there be sufficient funding for science in Africa in the future? 
Well, countries in sub-Saharan Africa still spend only an average of half a percent of their GDP on research and development compared to uh, almost 2% in Canada. However, after so many challenges, things are moving in the right direction for many African countries. Over the past few years, Africa has consistently outperformed the OECD in economic growth and signs are encouraging for increases in science budgets. For instance, the Kenyan Minister of Science told me that Kenya will quadruple its investment in science to 2% of its GDP, provided that a bill that she puts um, before the parliament is passed later this year. And there's other signs of progress too. South Africa has been chosen to co-host the Square Kilometer Array, the world's largest radio telescope. Canada is among a consortium of countries that will design, build, and participate in a research program around the telescope. And it's going to require highly trained scientists and engineers um, to um, participate in those research programs and um, analyze the massive amount of data that the telescope will produce. This in turn will offer new opportunities to Ames graduates. In fact, IDRC is investing an additional $2 million uh, over and above our initial investment um, to create postgraduate opportunities for Ames alumni um, in areas such as uh, chairs in physics or astronomy to link up with the Square Kilometer Array or in other important areas such as food security. The Ames model of helping Africans um, develop, um, um, build their capacity to in science, technology and innovation to solve their own developmental problems is consistent with um, IDRC's mandate of um, building local capacity instead of importing scientific know-how. And in taking a pan-African approach in training um, the best students in regional centers, um, Ames will enable student, students to stay close to home to help solve Africa's problems. And in fact, three quarters of Ames graduates have elected to stay in Africa. The Ames model is also consistent with Canada's approach. A few years ago, the government of Canada moved to uh, an innovative partnering approach with Canada instead of merely giving aid. And Canada's contribution to Ames is not near, merely um, consistent with this approach, it's emblematic. Investing in, in uh, developing countries to improve people's lives is uh, the right thing to do. It reflects Canada's values. But um, it is also an investment in Canada's future prosperity. Uh, a more developed world um, is in Canada's interest. It gives us highly skilled partners with whom to trade, to collaborate, and innovate. And that benefits our economy as well as theirs. And furthermore, we need global science collaboration to solve shared problems. Uh, we need continents from, we need experts, sorry, from all continents um, to participate in solving these problems. Um, whether it's um, modeling climate change, um, analyzing analyzing food and water scenarios, or tracking avian influenza, influenza, all of these problems require advanced mathematical skills, and these are the types of skills that Ames will give to Africa. Pour conclure, j'aimerais vous laisser avec les... To conclude, I'd like to leave you with the following message. Uh, science and innovation can uh, reduce poverty. Scientific cooperation, world scientific cooperation is in the interest of Canada. On developing scientific capacity in the developing world through important programs such as AIMS. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. And uh, just gives you an idea of the, the light in the window that Canada can be and your tax dollars can be on important innovation around the world. I was asking today in the board meeting, I, is there another uh, uh, word for research? Well, there may not be another word, but there is another phrase, and that's uh, lighting the way to the future. And I think that's... Uh, certainly very much what this program uh, does. It's now my honor to introduce David Malone, IDRC's president, and um, uh, he is uh, a veteran of Canada's Foreign Service. He's a very distinguished uh, scholar, has published several books, and 
uh, countless articles on both foreign policy and development, and he's been an enormous asset to IDRC since 2008. Before that, he was Canada's High Commissioner to India, and before that, uh, he ran our mission to the UN. He was, um, many years ago when I was the Secretary of State for External Affairs, which it then was, he was one of the rising stars in the Department of Foreign Affairs, and he has certainly uh, lived up to his, to his uh, beginning. He's going to speak to us today, and then we're going to have questions and answers, which I will moderate. Uh, as so, uh, David, do you want to come and talk to us? And then uh, we'll turn it over to our audience, and then we'll turn it back to me. Merci beaucoup, uh, Barbara. Well, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, Monty was quite bright in his uh, words that he addressed to you. You are an excellent uh, chair of the governing uh, board, and I have learned a great deal from you, also from Denis Desautel. In the federal public service and administration, people working on politics know scant little about finances and administration. And we, IDRC, our program policies and management in financing, uh, we are all working with all three together. And Denis was really of great assistance to us. And I thank him sincerely for him because. I will take to Tokyo everything I learned from you, Denis. Thank you very much. Monty, you were far too uh, generous for me, but I, I thank you. As is the case with Monty, when I first came to IDRC, I knew very little about development. Development uh, in the field in Egypt and Sudan. And I was aware, like all of us are aware, that health breakthroughs often come from research. And I was aware that agricultural uh, productivity and, and food, research, food security breakthroughs uh, often come from research. But because I wasn't one of those researchers and didn't subscribe to science as regularly as I might have, I simply didn't follow all of that as closely. Uh, as I probably should have. Nevertheless, on getting here, uh, I started uh, learning about the practical uh, benefits of research in a wide array of fields uh, in developing countries. Um, development is often a very gloomy field. Uh, we tend to dwell on failure when we think of development. But actually, it's a field full of excitement. There's lots of success in development, in fact, success all over the place. In many ways, the developing world is a more optimistic part of the world at the moment than the Western world, which is in full bore crisis. And why is that? It's not so much because of aid. It's because of the constant struggle of the populations of the developing world to improve the lives of their children and the partnerships they establish with those of us outside their regions, which can be useful to them. Uh, Barbara mentioned that our focus is very much on uh, supporting uh, groups within society, populations, countries in, in a more abstract way uh, in mastering their own destiny and carrying themselves forward. One way we've done this, and it's in partnership with uh, four other uh, countries and uh, in two cases, foundations, has been uh, to uh, construct something known internationally as the think tank initiative. In Canada, we're very used to think tanks. We read newspapers, evidence is advanced, uh, advocacy is attached to the evidence. We're used to being influenced uh, by the product of think tanks, and think tanks often drive 
the development of policy. That's particularly evident in the United States, but it's also very true in Canada, in Britain, in a number of other countries. We would like it to be truer in the developing world uh, than it has been in the past, although a number of very strong think tanks have grown up in the developing world. So uh, with the Hewlett Foundation, whose idea it was, with the Gates Foundation, with the British Development Ministry, DFID, with the Dutch uh, Development Program, uh, leveraging about 10, 12 million Canadian dollars. We were able to gather about 100 million from the other donors and put together a program that supports the core capacity of think tanks in the developing world. Uh, it doesn't aim at uh, supporting their programs. They have lots of funders who are willing to support their programs. What they lack are funders who are willing to provide resources to improve their core capacity so that they can pay decent salaries, attract better staff, have the equipment they need, be able to reach out to the media, in effect, be more, um, more significant actors within their own society. A number of board members have visited some of these think tanks. I've visited some of them, and it's, it's a thrilling experience. Watching them develop evidence, watching them influencing the debates within their countries, and watching them ultimately influence political debate. And it's political debate in all of our countries that eventually results in public policy. So that's one exciting partnership we're involved in. Nasser spoke about AIMS, which is beginning to be a wider partnership also, starting with the uh, very important contribution of the Canadian government, but the initiative itself having started even earlier. Um, we also uh, manage for the Government of Canada a very exciting initiative that's unfolding within our country, uh, Grand Challenges Canada, which you read about in the newspapers every now and then, which is an initiative that aims to bring scientists from the developing world into the heart of the highest quality medical research aimed at the diseases and conditions of the developing world uh, that scientists can tackle. Um, it's getting off to a very exciting start. You may have read of a number of grants that have already been made to rising stars in the developing world in the field of medical research, also in Canada, and a number of larger grants to major research projects in those areas. Récemment, j'étais au Nigeria. Recently, I was in Nigeria when uh, I was there in my teens, so it was rather interesting for me to return 40 years later. And once I was there, the Minister for our Health held a meeting in Abidjan. And there was a whole research team that surrounded him. And that research team was co-financed by SIDA uh, and IDRC, and it was a research team uh, that uh, dealt with uh, a, a detailed census of the practices of uh, mothers of newborns in uh, various areas of Nigeria to know what their good and bad uh, practices were uh, for the health to provide better or worse health to their children. Why did the Minister for Health de do such a meeting with such a research team? Well, it's quite simple. Nigeria is a federal nation, such as Canada is. Health and health programs are provided by the constituent states of Nigeria. The Minister for Health of the other states within Nigeria, where this research was being done, wanted to learn more, wanted to know how at a lower cost, we could save more 
babies' lives. For a, a low cost, we can encourage mothers to adopt the best practices that would be far more successful for the children's health. Health doesn't hinge on great expense. On the contrary, generally, maternal and child health can be delivered at very, very low cost as long as the mothers know what to do and what is good for their babies. Every mother wants to help her baby, but many mothers don't know what helps their baby, can wind up feeding them the wrong things, can wind up in other ways actually damaging their prospects. So uh, uh, maternal and child health, which is Canada's flagship, initiative in the field of development is a good one because ultimately development has to occur at low cost. Very, very expensive development projects are going to be few and far between and will probably benefit relatively few people. Projects that can be delivered and improvements that can be delivered at very low cost are the ones that ultimately are likely to be adopted in the developing world. And those are the ones that very often IDRC has wanted to support. So I just wanted to share a few of these experiences of mine uh, at IDRC, why I've been so excited to work here. Uh, I'll take with me back to Asia uh, much of what I've learned here. Uh, and uh, I'll try to practice in Tokyo some of what I've learned here, particularly uh, what I've learned from a truly extraordinary board, a very, very committed board, and also from an exceptional finance and audit committee of a very serious board chaired by Denis Desotel. Need I add, after you listen to Nasser, that my colleagues in IDRC management and on the wonderful IDRC staff have been exceptionally exciting to work with. I'm grateful to them because I've learned from each and every one of them. Thank you very much. OK, merci, uh, David. Thank you, David. And now, at this time, it's up to you. You have the floor. Uh, we will answer your questions in either French or English. Uh, there are microphones, and it's up to you. We welcome any questions you may have. Yes, it does work. Madam Chairman, thank you for this invitation. Uh, I ha I've learned to better know IDRC. And you did indicate that one of IDRC's priorities is agriculture and food security. The FAO has been uh, created for. Uh, we do not uh, forget the numerous success stories of FAO. But don't you think that uh, soon we'll celebrate the 70th anniversary of FAO, and it needs to be evaluated to see what are the strong parts and what are the less to, to have developing countries be self-reliant? Thank you. Uh, good question. I should have asked people to identify themselves also. I, you sound like an advocate uh, for FAO, or perhaps not. But um, uh, can you tell us what uh, your name, sir? And My name is Safwat Ayoub, and I represent the South North Forum. Uh, it's a small think tank, but we have also an arm from development. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I am not about to pronounce a death warrant on the FAO, but I do think, I, I, I mean, if this is a question for me and I'm not the expert, I think most agencies should be uh, uh, evaluated uh, or should do a self-evaluation, um, you know, on a fairly regular basis as to uh, 
their original mandate, whether they're filling it, whether their mandate should change or whether they should uh, turn out the lights and go home. There are certainly UN agencies in the past that I felt should turn out the lights and go home. Uh, I don't know enough about the FAO to pronounce on it, but maybe David does. Uh, actually, like you, Barbara, I'm no expert on the FAO, but one thing I have learned at uh, IDRC uh, relates to what you were saying, rigorous evaluation, and not every 70 years, but each time you run a significant program or project. Uh, because uh, very rarely will a project be 100% success or program. And so it's not so much the successful elements that are interesting, it's where you could have done better. And that's how you improve over time, by reflecting on how you can do better. So uh, we are great believers in evaluation here. The board, by the way, puts us through our paces on evaluation because our evaluations, our program-wide evaluations, uh, go to the board. On agricultural research, I wanted to point to some exciting new directions that we're working in. Um, we've uh, funded a great deal of, of work uh, in, in the area, even on coastal management, on sustainable fisheries and so on, often uh, through researchers in the developing world, most often through them. But we've had a tendency, like many others, to ignore a set of very important actors in uh, agricultural research. And those are private sector actors who make their money out of agriculture. And they actually invest a great deal in research. Their ultimate aim, of course, is profit. But meanwhile, they advance science quite often. And so uh, about six months ago, perhaps not quite that much, my colleague Jean Lebel, who's sitting with Denis Desotel here, um, got together a meeting of a wide range of actors uh, working in agricultural research, including private sector ones, to discuss how breakthroughs, again, can be made available without patenting instantly everything that uh, crosses a screen for uh, the poorest population so that orphan crops can actually be cultivated, that uh, marginal livelihoods can become less marginal, so that pooling of discovery can occur. Ultimately, by the way, it's in the interest of um, uh, agricultural produce companies to have more prosperous clientels around the world. Having clientels, ultimately, many of whom are living in great poverty, doesn't benefit uh, large corporations at all. But this was a conversation that hadn't really been tried in Canada before. I think it had been tried in one or two other places. We were a little bit nervous about it. We didn't really know whether uh, an actual dialogue would take place or whether people would read rather hostile speeches at each other. But actually, it turned into a real sharing of perspectives, information, and uh, also uh, the promise of considerable follow-up. So I'd say the field of agricultural food and, and, and food security is changing because, as you suggest, Safwat, in your question, actually the challenge is growing. The challenge isn't receding in the area of food security. So actually we have to get smarter at it and we have to get more collaborative at it if we're going to meet the challenge of food security again at reasonable prices. The rich will always have food security. It's the poor uh, who won't and our concern is largely with those in developing countries who otherwise might be on the brink of or beyond the brink of food insecurity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, monsieur. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Dooley. I'm a mem member of the public that comes to these things. 
and I have a background in the labor movement. And thank you for putting on, uh, Mr. Malone here, and putting on these events over the year where people can come and everybody is welcome. So I'm just somebody who just comes really probably in from the street, but having a, a profound interest in the work. And further to the question, actually, I just wanted to raise something here. I, I, I'm pulling out from your book here. I have a comment on it. But in here on page 11, and it just jumped out at me because it's, it's right on the topic. Where I have a question, but it's right on the topic we're talking about. And it's talking about, in your book here on page 11, you'll see it talks about the multi-pronged approach to improve agricultural practices in India where the development of millet, but through a very, 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 very fundamental, simple process of developing a dehulling machine, um, and which can be made, hard work which can be made, I'm reading off the thing here, the easy for village metal, I'm a former machinist, I have a background in the labor movement, and I have worked in third world countries. And I was active, just as a way of disclosure here, in an organization for many years called Tools for Peace. And we found over the decades that, in past things, that some of the most simple processes we're having, basic tools that we can buy here and we throw out, and getting them into third world countries. And the village metal worker, is a key person in the third world country. And here we have one of the finest examples that just jumped out at me. I don't really know what my question is because what I'm saying is here, this is exactly what it's all about, a dehulling machine made by village metal workers. But now there's a small question here to plug in. A question mark here, power, access to power, is it solar or wind, how do you get about that? Now I think to myself, this is a fundamental here and it's a very basic fundamental where you're using basic uh, metalwork ingredients where you're or utilizing the skill and the industrial kind of uh, lower level industrial proletariat and in, 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 that's in agriculture. I think there should be more work and more research done in this link up here between the village uh, uh, metal workers, uh, uh, and I grew up in a village in Ireland where they were very important, and the processing of making food accessible. I think this is a wonderful piece of work here. I commend you for it, and I think this should be an area of expansion. Uh, it's a question, is that something, because it's so easy, really, when you think about it, but it would need a lot of work, and this is an area where you'd work and utilize and connect up with, I've mentioned it here before, the labor movement and the trade unions in the various countries. So, so there's my question, linking this up, uh, a, a, a making, which does make work. You, you saw it here, and I'm sure there's many more examples of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think that it's not just in uh, probably the, the machine tool, and I didn't quite hear specifically what you were referring to, but the, to the machine tool or the machine building capacity, it's okay, of, uh, of, of a village. And there are other skills other small skill sets that make a village an economy and that can be developed to turn it into a larger economic group. But I'm going to ask David to do the actual answer. Well, thank you, thank you very much for that. It so happens that uh, early uh, this year, I visited the research team in a very remote part of India in northern Karnataka, which um, has been uh, centrally involved in this work. And again, you touch on something very important. If you come up with a really sophisticated machine that uh, can preserve as much of the millet grain as possible, but it costs a million dollars, it's just not going to work in poor communities. If you come up with a machine that's pretty basic, that uh, requires very little power or can even be powered by hand, the likelihood of that being used to extract maximum nutrition from the millet grain is much greater. Interestingly, this team, as I say, was working in the town of Darwad in an agricultural university. And as is so often the case in India, it was directed by an extraordinary woman. 
of uh, a certain age, a scientist who had spent her whole life working on improving livelihoods at a very basic level, again, low cost improvements. It was lovely to see because she was worshipped by her students. The students could see that she was transforming lives and that their work was transforming lives because they're also looking at cross-breeding of millet grains to find the millet grains that will most easily lend themselves to uh, translation into food. So the work never stops. You can get the optimal machine in terms of lowest cost and highest productivity, but you may still want a more nutritious millet grain. So the exciting thing about development is you break through at one level, but then there's a next level and you, you want to, you know, get more nutrition out of the, the, the millet crops. And it's very important because the, the levels of nutrition vary enormously in millet in uh, India. So for me, it was thrilling seeing this team of young people working around an extraordinary woman three times their age, learning a tremendous amount from her, and they will then go out out and try to multiply, so to speak, the effort being made. And I should add that the grant from IDRC that was supporting this work, and there's quite a lot of work going on in the field of millet, uh, was for well under a million dollars. So with well under a million dollars in India, there's a whole lot you can achieve. Thank you. Uh, oh, sir. Thank you. Pedro Lodon from uh, Britain Health Electorate Participation Director. Uh, I'm sorry, to... could, you, could you repeat that for me? It's, I'm not, That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> to Dave Maloney, since you are going to leave us, uh, could you please tell us, International Development Research Center, if you'd have to hyphenate it, where would you put the hyphen? Well, I think every part of um, IDRC except the center is important. In a way, uh, we're just an instrument at IDRC uh, that supports uh, development research internationally. But Canada is a very important element of that. Uh, the willingness of Canadian citizens to support uh, development activities around the world is critical. This is done in many ways, but very meaningfully through uh, the government's aid program. I should have mentioned early on, it's difficult to situate IDRC, and I'll come back to you, sir, um, in Canada's aid program without knowing uh, the size of the program overall and the size of IDRC. Canada spends, the government of Canada spends around $5 billion on development. CEDA spends uh, about $3.5 billion of that, perhaps a little bit more. IDRC's uh, parliamentary grant and some additional funding we have from the government for projects like Grand Challenges Canada comes up to about uh, $200 million a year, and we raise about $70 million more ourselves from other sources. But what that tells you is that we represent about 4% uh, of the government spending on development. So we are quite small uh, within the world of uh, Canada's general aid effort, but you can buy an awful lot of research. You can support an awful lot of research for $270 million, and that's what we try to do. But still, is international development or international development research center? Well, I think the development research is what's important, but we do operate in developing countries. It's important to understand that we don't support development research in the United States unless it is, it is done by people from the developing world. We spend the vast majority of our money internationally in developing countries. In Canada, 
we like to link Canadian researchers to developing country researchers, but we like to see if at the Canadian end we can get somebody else to pay for the Canadian researchers while we support the researchers in the developing world. One more. Development means what? Uh, what is our paradigm? It's a very complicated issue, development, and we've been working on it with a group of friends and research colleagues of ours. Um, it means different things to different people. The critical ideas to do with development revolve around uh, governance and economic health. But economic health can be defined in many different ways. So it's a very contentious area, an agreeably contentious area, actually, because many different conceptions, uh, each legitimate, contend for dominance within the field of development. So I'm not going to answer today, but I love joining in the contention over what development is, ideally, with people who are a lot wiser than I am. But not here. Next question, please. My name is Sachiko Kuda, and I'm proud to say that I'm an employee of IDRC. And um, as our second, the second questioner uh, mentioned, I really appreciate these public meetings and one of the most astonishing meetings, I think, uh, that I attended here was when the Solicitors General of a number of Central American uh, countries came to talk about uh, uh, post-conflict development and, and the, the, the issue of violence in, in their countries. And um, this meeting has uh, shone the spotlight on some of our programming in agriculture, in public health, in maternal and child health, in innovation. But I'd, I'd like to give um, you, David, the opportunity to talk a bit about the program we have on governance issues and development in post-conflict societies. Thanks. Yes. Uh, well, I'd, I'd be happy to do so, but you touch on something that's been very important to several of us over recent years and strongly supported by the board. We've wanted to do more of our work publicly uh, in Canada. Not everybody's interested, and you can't expect everybody to be as interested in development as those of us working in the field are. But by bringing a variety of people with different perspectives on uh, areas that we support research in, we educate ourselves, but why educate ourselves alone? Why not open up the process more widely? So we've tried to do quite a lot more of that, I'd say over the past decade. It isn't as, as recent as the last five years. And I hope this is something that will continue at IDRC. There's no reason why exchanges on these issues need to unfold behind closed doors. There's plenty to be learned from all sorts of different sources uh, on the issues uh, we work on. As to um, violence in much of the world, uh, we could spend all of our resources on issues of violence, violence against women, violence against certain groups within society, and marginalization. But actually, as Sachiko knows, our programming in the area of uh, security and justice is quite modest. So we, the, the amount of money we devote to it is quite modest. We have a very dynamic small team that has worked on it a lot. Some extraordinary work in the Arab world, for example, in these fields. Uh, but precisely because we have a small budget for it, we have to think very hard about how we're going to spend that money. And it's a very exciting young team, by and large, that works on this. And I enjoy the results of their work because I learn from it. But I, I did want to make clear it's not a major vector of IDRC programming. Our major programs are agriculture, environment, and water, which we bunch together. 
uh, health, by which we mean mainly health systems, but also Grand Challenges Canada on medical research. Um, we uh, work also on economic policy and social policy. And finally, Nasser's terrific program on uh, science and technology for development and innovation. And so uh, our work in security falls uh, at uh, a smaller level of spending than any of those. If we had more money, we'd probably do more of that. Well, um, I, let me then close out our uh, public meeting tonight and thank you all of you for being here and for listening intently. I was watching uh, while David was talking and uh, Monty and Nasser, and uh, I want to thank them for their uh, participation and uh, Denis, as always, for his backup and support and financial astuteness, and um, our staff members who are here. And uh, mostly, I would like to close the evening by thanking uh, David for his time here. Um, I was very happy to have uh, just become a member of the board uh, shortly before David arrived. As I said, I had known him going back uh, into the Dark Ages. Um, when when I was at Foreign Affairs. It was a very exciting time, and he was doing so well then and has continued to do so. And the work he has done at IDRC and his leadership has been exemplary. We are very much going to miss him here, uh, both his, uh, his personality as well as his astuteness and his ideas. And he is now heading off to become the rector of the United Nations University in Tokyo. So he has another career in front of him and uh, another world to conquer. And David, we wish you very well in this endeavor. You know that uh, you will always uh, cast a long shadow at IDRCs. And we really appreciate everything you've done. Thank you.